Hey all here OS Reviews, in the second half of 2023, Huawei is making a little bit of a resurgence by announcing their latest flagship, the Mate 60, to widespread anticipation, and it's using their own Kirin 9000S processor. It's making a bit of a splash because despite political sanctions from the US restricting the type of parts that Huawei is able to use, they were still able to kind of get around that showing resilience and perhaps signaling a soft comeback of sorts for a brand that was once on the climb in global markets like Europe and the US, but unfortunately was really halted by political tensions. It's really unfortunate because as consumers, it's always great to have more choices and options available to pick between. After all, competition is what drives innovation and also reduces the cost of products, making them more accessible and affordable. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to hence take a look back at a past Huawei phone. It's their P30, one of their last flagships that was released globally, including in the US and Europe, with all Google Play services on board before government-imposed regulations and bans started popping up. So this is a device that you can now find on the secondhand market for around 150 to 200 bucks, depending on the region that you're in. So it puts it into squarely budget territory. The P30 was released back in 2019, and the first thing that catches your eye is the gorgeous gradient finish on the back of this phone, which changes to crazy looking colors depending on the angle that you pointed in in this breathing crystal colorway, though of course it also comes in other classic shades like Amber Sunrise, there's also more of a blue Aura shade, white, and black. But aesthetics aside, this was also a pretty powerful and competent phone underneath the hood. It's powered by, again, their in-house silicon, the Kirin 980 processor, which is an octa-core 7 nanometer chip. It is 4G LTE, but it's actually quite competitive to the Snapdragon 855 in terms of benchmarks, just a hair behind. And as we've seen in other 855 phones in 2023, such as the Samsung Galaxy S10 line, they're still very competent performers when it comes to daily usage, still feeling quite zippy, even for some moderate gaming here and there. It's holding up extremely well. Now inside, we had a 3,650 milliamp hour capacity battery, which can top up at 22 watts using the USB Type-C port, which also serves as a external video output. When you connect it to a screen or a TV, it can transform into a desktop mode, very similar to on Samsung's DeX mode on their devices. It is also coupled with up to 8GB of RAM, and there is a 40 megapixel primary camera with Leica optics, coupled with an 8 megapixel telephoto 3x optical zoom lens and another 16 megapixel ultra wide angle lens. They're all quite practical choices and useful with a dual tone LED flash. This was also when Huawei phones were very neck-to-neck -neck when it came to photography performance with Google Pixel devices in the Android landscape. So thankfully, it's not just a matter of branding, but the actual processing, computational photography capabilities are really excellent. As a flagship of yesteryear, again, the construction quality is top-notch, including aluminum unibody rails on the sides, and I really love the accented red power button, as well as the volume rocker that are super tactile, and also the flattened edges on the top, as well as the bottom, just adds a little bit more character. Now this phone does also have a 3.5mm headphone jack, really a rarity in this day and age. On the front we have a 6.1 inch Full HD Plus OLED display which is HDR compatible and offers beautiful looking colors as well as an under display fingerprint scanner. And this screen is completely flat so there are no curved edges for any accidental touches. Also houses the 32 megapixel front facing camera and a water drop notch on the top. Although at the time there were already some brands experimenting with even more bezel-less trends including pop-up selfie cameras, I think looking back Huawei made a pretty smart choice on the P30. It's conservative looking but still at the same time relatively modern even now with fewer moving parts, meaning that there's fewer chance of mechanical failure, and still we have a pretty high screen-to-body ratio overall. One thing I do really like about this phone as well is the compact size. At, again, around 6 inches, it's quite easy to manage with one hand, that is compared to phones now that are getting larger and larger with nearly 6.7-inch, even 7-inch displays in some cases. That being said, the 3,600 milliamp hour capacity battery may not be the biggest in the world due to the compact size, though it can still mostly last through a day's usage without too many any problems, and the phone is rather efficient, it never really overheats or gets too hot. Thermal throttling is generally not a problem on the Kirin 980, thankfully. In terms of the software situation, this phone originally came with Android 9.0 Pi out of the box, however, Huawei has been pretty diligent in terms of pushing software updates over. And again, the P30 does have Google services on board, so you can access the Play Store, unlike some of their newer phones, in which Google services are completely missing. Now, in response to that, Huawei 
created quote unquote Harmony OS, which at first drew a lot of excitement because folks thought they were making a alternative operating system due to the danger of US regulators maybe even blocking Android from being accessible on future Huawei devices. They really wanted to remove as much dependency as possible from third parties. However, later on it was revealed that Harmony OS is really just a rebranded version of EMUI, to be completely honest. It's still technically Android behind the scenes. And with Harmony OS 3.0, it is technically powered by Android 12 in terms of the source code. Still, it's a fairly up-to-date version of the operating system. You won't have any problems in terms of running the latest applications. Otherwise, system performance continues to remain quite responsive and enjoyable enough. Perhaps the biggest gap compared to newer flagship Android phones would be this is using a standard 60 hertz refresh rate screen as compared to something like 90 or 120, which might get you even faster frame rate and fluidity if you're scrolling super quickly. But on the flip side, it means that battery endurance is a little bit stronger, and also it's kind of expected from a phone from 2019. Now, Harmony OS definitely has a lot of deviances from a vanilla version of Android, I would say. So coming from a Google Pixel phone, it was still a pretty big adjustment process. In fact, I would say the UI is heavily inspired by iOS, like it or not. But by default, you have unlimited home screens to fill with new apps and icons once they are downloaded. You can also swipe down from the top two corners. On the left side will trigger any notifications, and on the right side is going to be your shortcuts for things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, so on and so forth. Connectivity options, including NFC, is also built in. It does have IP rating as well for water resistance, so no worries there. Although Qi wireless charging is one hardware feature that is missing on the standard P30. And even though Harmony OS and EMUI to the same extent are not my favorite skin on top of Android, I just think it's a little bit more on the cartoonish side, but at least it's different and all of the utility tools have been created by Huawei and give you a relatively cohesive look from the UI perspective. Responsiveness is not an issue and Huawei has some of their quote unquote AI widgets which tries to learn which apps you're commonly using and will push different information at a glance. It mostly functions as expected. Now taking just a closer look at the camera performance next, as aforementioned, it's a pretty decent shooter for its time. Huawei was one of the first companies to really push quote-unquote AI optimization features, so depending on what you're pointing the camera at, it will change the scene automatically if it recognizes text versus food versus landscapes, and it's a pretty intuitive UI. You are able to switch back and forth between the wide-angle lens as well as the three times optical zoom, and then up to five times digital crop if you desire to get a little closer to your subject. And down below here, we can also record video up to 4K, 30 FPS is supported, and there's plenty of options that you can further dig into. Here's also a pro shooting mode where you can change things like ISO, exposure yourself, and then under more you'll find even more utility functions like a monochrome mode, panoramic mode, light painting mode in the dark, manually turn on HDR, plus you can also further slide to capture bokeh aka portrait mode, and there also is the night mode here on the left which just captures more information by increasing the exposure time. You have to hold still for just a little bit longer but it ends up with a brighter, better looking result in low light situations. Filters can also be adjusted via collaboration with Leica and you're able to change kind of the color grading directly on the phone as you're taking the image. All in all, you still end up with very pleasing looking results even to this day, though I wouldn't say it's going to beat the newest generation flagships in terms of camera performance anymore. They're still more than satisfactory, easy to share on social media with plenty of vibrancy, color, and detail. Again, especially with the 40 megapixel primary sensor, if you're capturing in the full high resolution mode, there is plenty that you can zoom into for fine granular details. HDR is also generally doing a good job of keeping shadows and colors in line, not really overexposing or blowing out any highlights. If anything, one area that newer smartphone cameras have improved on would be in sensor size, as we're starting to see more and more 1-inch sensors start to become the norm, potentially resulting in even better low-light performance, quicker to snap, as well as a better natural bokeh just because of the larger sensor size. But again, this is still quite respectable. Now moving into a quick demo of video playback and the speaker quality next.
All right, so turning things down, some takeaways would be that, first of all, no issues in terms of modem connectivity with dual band Wi-Fi and both 4G LTE as well. Connect quickly with no real problems as far as buffering is concerned. Things load back quite quickly, even if you're watching it in high resolution like 2K or even 4K. And in terms of the audio quality, it is very clear sounding with sufficient depth and bass. It doesn't really blow out even at higher volume levels and generally sounds pleasing enough for a smartphone speaker. That being said, you don't really get true stereo separation. In other words, the earpiece doesn't serve as a second unit that provides you with better balance if you're holding it in this view. That would have been nice to find, but it is what it is. And at least you do have, again, 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. You can use wireless headphones if desired. Overall, the image quality is pleasant because of the old and nature and HDR10 support. Content does pop and look very vibrant on this display. Speaking of, here's also a quick demo of how it fares loading back a more complex web page like The Verge, and as you can tell, it's generally quick to buffer and load. Even with lots of videos and ads on this site, things are still quick to render, and text details easy to read, colors are still quite vibrant, so no problems here if you're trying to use this to read back articles. And now a quick demo of the aforementioned desktop mode. You can also mirror your screen as is, but really it's this one that transforms it into that pseudo computer view. Again, very similar to Samsung DeX. You can use the phone's display as a trackpad. You gain the power of having resizable windows, making it easier to do some multitasking and if you're changing back and forth between various apps, for example. And then just like DeX, at the very bottom here, you can also tap to bring up some additional applications, super similar to other desktop class operating systems. We can check out the battery status, change the volume levels, and find some of the more traditional Android navigational keys as well. And if you're wondering, yes, in the browser, now it will also open up the full desktop version instead of the mobile site, so you get a more comfortable canvas if you're doing a bit of work, emailing, researching, so on and so forth. Again, transforming your phone basically as your computer. And as far as doing a little bit of gaming is concerned, you certainly won't find any major problems with most titles, especially casual gaming. Even if you're trying to download Asphalt or PUBG, they can still be more than playable. It may not be the fastest anymore when it comes to smoothest animations 100% of the time versus the true flagships such as running on Slapdragon 8 Gen 2. However, it still is more than playable for almost all content that you download from the store. And I would argue for the vast majority of folks out there looking for just social media as well as doing some more basic gaming. If you are kind of into AAA style competitive gaming, then maybe you would want to get an even newer device. Uh, but overall, this is still perfectly serviceable. So that is the Huawei P30 Revisited, a flagship from this brand that was once growing and increasing their market share, but unfortunately was stunted by just politics at the end of the day. Really unfortunate to see. The P30 though remains one of their last devices with all Google services baked in. And I hate to say it, but compatibility with Google apps, including YouTube, as well as the Play Store, is kind of a must, especially for folks in the US and in Europe. So this phone, I would say, still remains a pretty decent choice now that it's in the budget territory. If you're looking to kind of save a few bucks, you're still getting a pretty smooth overall experience. Still gets you a large display and a pretty compact frame that is bright and vibrant. Even though Huawei's skin on top of Android is definitely not my favorite, visually speaking, all the apps are functional. Performance-wise, there is really nothing that you are missing here, plus the presence of some extras, including the desktop mode, are just really tastefully done and make the overall experience quite enjoyable as you start looking a little bit deeper. So all in all, I would say the P30 still has plenty of life left and again, can be an excellent budget smartphone option now here in 2023. You can check out more details if interested in the links down below. For now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews.